We are now going into a workshop on engagement strategy for sustainability communications. The session in total is going to last 90 minutes. We've got a panel of five of us, um, each of whom will do a six minute introduction using up half an hour. We will then go into workshops for 40 minutes, um, five different workshops around the room, and then we'll bring it back for a closing of 15 to 20 minutes at the end. Um, so, it's a great pleasure to, uh, to welcome you to this workshop, and I'll just very briefly introduce uh, the panel. On the right, we have Sarah Atkinson, who is the VP of Communications at CA Technologies, and she's going to be doing a workshop on the internal focus, so your employees as your brand advocates. Over here on my right is Jukka Ahonen, who's the Senior Director and Head of Communications at the Nordic Investment Bank, and his workshop is going to be on sharing your long-term value creation journey. Um, next to him is Andrea Stoven, who's the Director of Global Sustainability Communications at AstraZeneca. Uh, and she's going to be talking about improving the relationship, investor relations and sustainability coming together. I am the former Director of Communications as of two weeks ago. Um, I, I'm now unemployed, I'm delighted to say, uh, just for another week. Um, <laughs> um, but I was Director of Communications at the NL Group in Rome. Um, and I'm going to be talking about how to build a brand with sustainability at its core. And then finally, Becky Willen, who's over there third on the right, uh, is the managing director at Given. And she's going to be talking about co-creation um, and how to use that uh, to build, to create real change. Um, she also has chocolate, by the way, but that does not mean that you can all go to her workshop. Um, so, without any further ado, I'd like to ask Sarah to stand up and kick things off for us. Thank you. Great, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes, super. So, I'd like to just spend a few minutes talking about CA Technologies Social Responsibility Program and how we developed that and how we evolved our brand ambassadors and brand advocacy. But before I do that, I want to just give a little bit of context as to the methodology that we used. Many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with Maslow's hierarchy. Maslow was a, um, a psychologist who identified five needs for survival. The first one being um, survival itself, the basic need for money and a secure job. Number two is safety, so the need to have security in your workplace. Number three is belonging, the importance of being part of a team. And number four is relevance and the sense of belonging in that team and some value and some, some real sense of achievement. None of that is really possible without getting to the level of self-actualization. And what I mean by that is most employees really have a level of ambition which may not necessarily be able to be achieved within their current work environment or their current role. So providing them with opportunities for additional learning, uh, additional growth and leadership opportunities really helps deliver much more engaged employees. Now, how does this really relate into sustainability? Well, if you apply that to um, your corporate workplace, paying your employees a fair salary, providing a safe work environment, creating a level of importance about their role, very, very important. And of course, recognition, in, in very key to employees to be recognized for what they're doing and to do that publicly as well. And it's at that point that employees really start to feel highly engaged. They become your brand ambassadors and they really become... Uh, contagious, if you like, contagious in your workplace where they're extremely positive and they are talking not just internally but externally as well. So just flipping that, rewinding a couple of years, um, CA Technologies relaunched its social responsibility program back in 2015. And the key for us was to put all of our employees at the heart of that strategy. We all work in environments that are reliant on technology, software, etc. And there is a chronic STEM skills shortage and a war for talent. So we decided with our employees that we would develop a program which is about inspiring and exciting young people about careers in STEM, using the role models and the fantastic experience of our own employees as part of that. 
So, the first thing we did is realise that not all of our employees actually are comfortable standing up uh, in front of a room full of teenagers talking about STEM. So we had to develop a series of volunteering opportunities, which included everything from delivering a webinar to teachers, to actually engaging with children, to translating materials for our translation team who rarely had the opportunity to, to leave the office. So creating something for everyone. The key was to start small. So running programs, first of all, in the UK, in Italy, in Germany, and working in a very agile way. So seeking feedback, not just from the employees, but also from the young people or the teachers that were engaged in our programs. And that was very important and started to build a very strong sense of satisfaction for the volunteers who realized the difference that they were actually making through the programs. And then moving on, it became apparent that employees were becoming very passionate about this. They were starting to talk about it between themselves. And so putting in place a recognition program was very important. So we developed um, a very uh, simple idea of recognizing employees on a quarterly basis by actually giving them a very small Lego character which we had made in their image. So if you had blonde hair, you had a little character with blonde hair. If you had a beard, you had a, a little Lego man with a beard. And this was presented to the employees um, publicly and they were recognized and rewarded at um, town hall meetings. Now, what this did is it created, again, more conversation in the business. Employees were wandering around the office seeing someone's Lego character and asking them what did it mean. People were very proud to talk about it. And then we realized that we could then take this externally. So we began to develop um, a platform, a narrative, both through our corporate communications team, but also empowering the employees to talk about their experiences of volunteering for our Create Tomorrow program. And we needed to give them guidelines. Not everyone felt happy doing this. So lots of support for them, but also some guidelines on what they could share and what they couldn't share, particularly working with young people. And this became very, very powerful. Since we've launched the program, um, our Create Tomorrow as a platform now uh, trends typically um, in the top three messages that people find out about our company when they're searching. So it's given us a great platform. And secondly, we've reached around um, 32,000 young people uh, and we have a goal to reach 50,000 by 2020. So a really, um, a, 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 an example really just to get the conversation going today about how to engage the employees that every part of the journey and then how to transfer them and make them those brand advocates for you. Yeah, I have some slides there. Can you put them up? Yeah, yeah. Okay, actually, <clears throat> I was looking at the, um, the heading of this uh, summit. It's Sustainability Reporting and Communication Summit. And um, so far, actually, there's been lots of uh, focus on this reporting part. So I think I will focus more on, on the communications part. Because it's important to remember that actually the... Um, the goal of many co communication functions is actually to tell the long-term uh, value creation story so that the, um, the stakeholders also understand it. In order to do that, I think you have to ask some questions, um, and um, these are the things I thought I will discuss in the workshop. The first question is, what does sustainability mean to your target groups? The second question, how to relate to different uh, sustainability uh, frameworks. And then finally, how to communicate your uh, long-term value. Just to say a few words about the Nordic Investment Bank. We are an international financial institution of the Nordic and the Baltic countries. And basically, our mission is to finance projects that improve uh, productivity and benefit the environment. This means that Basically, we were established for sustainability. You can also say what we are doing in terms of UN sustainability goals. You can choose the language. But basically, we were established by eight member countries uh, to finance uh, sustainable uh, projects. That's why we have actually had our own framework for sustainability uh, analysis for a very long time. Our the projects that we are financing 
Um, I think we did the first environmental analysis in 1994. And since that, we have been screening all, all our, our, our projects. And then we have also our own transparency regime. And the key point of this uh, transparency uh, uh, regime is that we actually publish all the loans uh, in real time that we are uh, granting. So everyone can go to the website and see that this is the loan deal that they have made. And there is also an exp explanation about uh, a sustainability summary of that, of that loan. I would say that there was a lot of talk about real-time transparency and real-time real sustainability reporting. I would argue that the fact that we publish these loans uh, in real-time is, is a really big asset. Then you can ask that what does sustainability mean to your target groups? And I think you have to ask this question, otherwise it's very difficult to formulate uh, the messages. We have done that um, in a way from our owners, which are the member countries. We get that kind of directly, because we are integrated. It's the governments who actually say what we should do, the Nordic and the Baltic governments. And they basically say that do good, be sustainable. And what is our reporting? Our reporting is to them uh, just to show that we are doing actually what they want us to do. And then what do we get back is the political uh, support. Lending customers. Of course, we ask in our stakeholder surveys that what is it that you want from us? And okay, they want competitive loans and they want to know about the offering. And to be actually honest, just a few years ago in these surveys, you, you found that uh, many of those saw that the reporting as such is some kind of a burden. And there you have seen, there has been a big change during the last, last few years. And now there are even companies who want to put on the wall a certificate that they have got the financing from us, so there is a clear change. But I would say that the biggest change during the last years has been among the investors, so those who are buying our bonds. And, but also there you see that most investors actually, what do they want? They want stability, they want to sleep well. But then the sustainable financing has of course become a very big, big, big issue. We have talked about the green bonds, um, and um, uh, then I would say that basically, when we started this business with environmental lending, there were no green bonds. So the focus on sustainability, basically, what started with our owners is now getting more popular among the investors, uh, uh, customers, and now basically the key driver is the investor. Uh, just an example is the green bonds. Uh, we are the biggest issuer of green bonds in the Nordics, and um, the basically it's a very simple idea. What is a green bond? The main innovation and the idea of the green bond is actually the dedicated uh, use of proceeds, which creates the need uh, for, for information. That also, of course, leads to the question that how to relate to these different sustainability frameworks, because investors are asking for that. I mean, I said that we started our analysis, you know, in the 90s, this environmental and sustainability analysis, but it's, of course, our analysis and investors of course want to be able to compare institutions and that's what, of course we also have to relate to these different um, dif different um, uh, frameworks but there actually when you look at it uh, I would say that you get a little bit this feeling that um, welcome to the jungle because there are so many you know it's even hard to remember uh, all of those, these kind of different frames, TCFD, G, uh, Green Pond Principles, GRI, you name it. There are so many of them. It's kind of quite difficult from the communications point of view, at least, to, to sometimes to understand what's going on. And then you have these sustainability rating agencies who are also watching you, and they have their own, own methodologies. But of course, we need to also um, align with this uh, international recognized frameworks. We cannot only rely on our own framework. Uh, so we do the environmental bond report, we do the financial report, we do the activity report according to GDR, GRI, so we do many things. But this is the next slide is the one that I like most. There's a risk with all this reporting. And I think from the communication point of view, there's a risk that you are reporting yourself to death. So in a way, so you, you kind of, if you're a communication person, I, I started my career as a journalist. I mean, you are not anymore communicating. You are just sort of writing statistical reports uh, and, and fulfilling and ticking the boxes and obligations. But who is really uh, actually reading, reading those, those reports? So just finally, the question how to communicate the long-term value, just very briefly. I would say that 
the good old journalistic uh, questions are quite good. Who, what, where, when, and maybe even why. Sometimes when you have these aggregate uh, portfolio level uh, impact indicators that we are also collecting uh, a lot from, from our, our lending customers, what does it tell you that if you write on page 52 of your report that now uh, we have been contributing to 21 kilometers of new railway uh, lines in, in, in the northern Europe? It doesn't tell you much. Actually, that's why I'm coming back to this thing with this real-time loan disclosure. So you say who is doing what, where, and when, and why. So, for example, you, you should not kind of somehow uh, jump into this world of sustainability reporting uh, so that you somehow start to forget this, this basic idea that, for example, these people who are running into this metro, they want to know that we, we can say that we have financed the metro in Matinkula Espo, which started operations, blah, 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 and it is going to reduce uh, CO2 emissions and the bottlenecks in the, in the traffic infrastructure uh, in the region. So I think this is the key. You should not, at the cost of this sustainability reporting, uh, forget these very basic, uh, very basic questions of, 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 of communication. Um, and especially in journalism, this is what you do when you send a young journalist, go there, come back with the story. You have to ask this, uh, answer these questions. And then the good old storytelling also that uh, there's so much competition for in, uh, your time. I mean, half of you are watching your, your, your mobile phones because you find it's more interesting than to listen to me. So, you know, I'm competing with you. And that's why actually if you want that someone is at least for a moment uh, listening to you, you have to visualize, you have to sim simplify, and you have to give the content. So these are the questions that I want to discuss in the workshop. Thank you, Andrea. The floor is yours. Thanks, Jukka. Hi, everyone. So um, the workshop session that I'm going to be um, running is about improving the relationship with investor relations. I'd just like to caveat to start with that we have a very good relationship in sustainability at AstraZeneca with our investor relations team. Um, we have, however, changed over the past year or so um, how we go about working together. So I think there'll be some tips and, and ideas we can share. Um, but I mean, just to put this into some context, uh, you know, being a sustainable company is uh, about being around for the long term. Um, and that's particularly important for AstraZeneca as a pharmaceuticals company, where it's actually an average of about 10 years to get your product to market. Or, or in other words, actually the patients taking your medicines. So you know, if you're not in it for the long game, you, you're never gonna have any success in, in the field in which you've chosen. Um, so it's even more important as a pharmaceuticals company to be thinking long term. Um, we see sustainability becoming increasingly important to our investor base. Um, so our IR team are getting week on week increases in direct questions to them about ESG matters. Um, they're also finding those questions to become more and more specific, detailed and educated. So we've really had to up our game a little bit between the two, sustainability and the, and the IR group, um, to make sure we're meeting the needs of this important stakeholder group. And even um, you know, like recently, we've had the letters from BlackRock and Vanguard, which are two of our biggest holders, um, which have actually sent letters to the Fortune 500 CEOs pushing for more focus on sustainability matters. So this is really becoming uh, core to our investor base, not just a, a kind of you know they're doing nice things. Um, so I think some, there's some broad similarities between all stakeholder groups which we have to communicate with. Um, and as, as Yucca was pointing out, you know, it comes down to stories for most of these groups at the end of the day. Um, but there's also some differences. And with the investor audience, we find there are some specific differences with which we need to pay particular attention to. Because what they want is confidence. They want to see clear progression against clear targets within a clear time frame, whether that's quarter on quarter or annually or however you map that. And you know, the more kind of formulaic this is, it's easier for them to see that clear progression and it's easier for them to also then compare between organizations. If we can keep these specific needs in mind, it much better um, 
uh, and much more smoothly works with the IR team because we're making sure that we're meeting the needs of their constituents um, and not clashing into each other um, the whole time. I think another important aspect to focus on as well is that the aspect of, of this need for confidence from this group is also the, the attitude to risk. So where we as an organisation are now starting to push more into a, a more and more innovative space from a sustainability perspective, um, it sometimes feels like we're having a slightly different conversation with the investor community because they're focused heavily still on avoidance of risk. Um, so it's, it's starting to um, try and sort of gently move that conversation along so that we're also addressing concerns about business risk but also moving them into a direction where they can see the value of innovation in sustainability areas as well. Um, so hopefully we can expand on this a little bit more on the table discussions. Great, thanks very much, Andrea. That was actually a brilliant introduction to... Oh, there we go. Should have been... No. Can we have my presentation, or do we want to go first? Do we want to switch? We'll switch. Thank you. You a little bit about Given because I'm sure um, lots of you haven't heard of our business, but um, we're a brand purpose agency. So we're a team of 25 sustainability strategists, brand marketing experts, and innovation specialists. Um, and we work with clients to build strategies, deliver innovation um, and storytelling um, for brands like John Lewis and Partners, Ikea, uh, Diageo, um, TUI Nationwide. And, and a big part of what we do is really help unlock the value of sustainability from a brand and communications perspective. Um, but ultimately, I always think that we're actually in the business of creating change, change for the businesses that we work with with and for, change for their brands, and change for the society that we operate in. And I think, you know, I think we, ultimately we're all in the business of change, and I think we must also recognize how hard that change can be. And when we talk to our clients about some of the barriers for creating change within organizations, um, they talk, tend to talk about three main um, issues. Um, so the first uh, is around a lack of buy-in, especially at a senior level. This was something we heard quite a lot about yesterday afternoon, about the challenges and, and what you do if you face a lack of buy-in, um, especially from your CEO. Um, but there's also a real complexity. So these are issues that are inherently complicated. Um, they're difficult to communicate simply. And I think what our clients find is that people outside of sustainability teams also find the content quite uninspiring often as well. But finally, um, there are often conversations that are driven by problems, not solutions. I mean, even just to go back to your point, Andrea, about the sort of the focus on, on risk. And I think so the idea of sort of trying to create change around a problem rather than presenting a solution can be really hard to do. Um, so at Given, we believe that a methodology called co-creation can be a really powerful tool for creating change around sustainability within organizations. So uh, co-creation um, is the act of bringing multiple stakeholder groups together to work together to unlock uh, business opportunities and to solve challenges. Now, as a concept, that might sound familiar, but co-creation isn't about focus groups. It's not about the typical stakeholder engagement that you might do as part of your materiality process. And it's not about crowdsourcing ideas through sort of big digital platforms. It's about bringing people, experts, customers, colleagues together, 20, 30, sometimes even 50 people at a time, and giving those people the tools to solve really important challenges. Now, there's a reason why we think that co-creation, or there's several reasons why we think co-creation is particularly effective when it comes to sustainability. Um, and that really comes down to three things. Um, so the first is that we believe that these sort of complex challenges that we're dealing with are best solved with rich inputs and diverse viewpoints. And so when we work with clients, we're often bringing multiple different stakeholders into the process at different points. So we tend to work with experts to really help dimensionalize the issues that our clients are thinking about. We work often with customers um, to help our clients understand the potential impact 
that thinking about particular issues or dealing with issues in a particular way could have on their brand. And we work with colleagues to really get under the skin of how change needs to happen within those organisations. I think the second reason is that within sustainability, we need to not just imagine, but actually work towards creating a better future. And as sustainability practitioners in the room, I'm sure we all recognise that we don't have all of the solutions yet that we need, whether that's in terms of technology or operations or even from a communications perspective. And so what we need is approaches that are generative and not just evaluative. We need approaches that actually help us develop and deliver new solutions, new ways of working. And the final um, reason why co-creation is such a powerful tool when it comes to sustainability and creating change around sustainability within organizations is that we find actually buy-in is probably the number one barrier to change within organizations. And the way that we design our co-creation processes involve um, a whole range of different internal stakeholders, whether that's the people who ultimately need to say yes to your idea, the leadership, whether it's the people that need to fund the idea, or actually the people that need to fund uh, to make that change happen. Co-creation is designed to bring all of those people together to get their engagement, um, and that we found is the most uh, powerful way to, to create that kind of buy needed for change. So what I wanted to do uh, with um, the workshop was actually bring some of the, the, the principles and practices around co-creation to life and actually give uh, you, as well as chocolate, um, some practical uh, tools to, to, to take away and actually be able to use uh, from tomorrow within your organisations to help um, create the kind of change that I think we're all here to, to talk about. Thanks, Becky. Okay, so... Um my little presentation quickly for six minutes is on building a sustainability brand. Um, and you should know that I was working at the NL Group, um, Europe's largest power utility, one of the biggest in the world, and, and the largest renewable energy company in the world. Um, but we've got some big issues, and a lot of them are around sustainability. The first question to ask, and actually some of the panelists have already done it, what is sustainability? And at this stage, I need to provide full disclosure. I've left NL to move to BlackRock. Uh, so that's my next employer. But Andrea um, very helpfully mentioned the letter, and here it is. So this is Larry Fink's annual letter to CEOs, the 2018 one. Three or four little excerpts from it, in which he calls very clearly for a, an articulation from companies on their strategy for long-term value creation through social purpose. Now, you can call it whatever you like. You can call it social purpose. I call it sustainability. Because at the end of the day, there is only one stakeholder group that can fire a management team. There is only one stakeholder group to whom any management team in the world has a fiduciary duty. And that is the shareholders. They are the only ones. And so everything that a management team does, and consequently we as communicators do, must be anchored in shareholder value. It has to be. Otherwise, we are not aligned with our chief executives and our management teams. So I would say that sustainability is about ensuring, as Andrea articulated just now, ensuring that the company is around for the long term. How can you make sure that your company is, in fact, sustainable long term? What is a brand? The other part of this uh, little conundrum. So this is very simplistic. Of course, we don't have a lot of time. But this is how I think about a brand. And this is how I got my team at NL to think about a brand. It's an articulation of who you are, what you do, and how you do it. But because we're anchoring everything in shareholder value, we need to understand that when shareholders buy a share today, they're buying the future earnings of your company, not the past earnings of your company or your track record. They use that, but that's not what they're buying. And so the second piece is really important. Who you want to become, what you will do, and how you will do it. And so based on that, I've come up with this. This is not by anybody famous, it's just me. Um, this is what I think is the definition of a sustainability brand. Others might disagree, but this is how I think you could articulate it. A sustainability brand articulates for the benefit of management, employees, customers, suppliers, investors, etc., what the business is going to do in order to sustain its delivery of value for shareholders. That, I think, is what a brand must do. 
And if a brand does that and articulates accurately how the business is going to sustain that delivery of value for shareholders, then it is indeed a sustainability brand. So at NL, we went through a rebranding process four years ago, three years ago, um, and I'm going to give you a little bit of insight into this, and we'll use that as the basis for the workshop uh, that we're going to be running shortly. So we started with who we are, who we are today, and this was 2015, and we, this gigantic business, 90 gigawatts of installed capacity, we could power the United Kingdom three and a half times just by ourselves. We had 2.1 million kilometers of grid network. You could go around the world 57 times with our distribution network. We, did, we delivered light every day to half a billion people around the world. The scale of this business was huge, and we thought that that was the power of NL. But in order to make that power relevant in the future, in a world in which everything is interconnected, we recognized that we needed to open it up. And so we developed what we called our open power sustainability strategy. And open power says that we will open up the power that we have and make it available to everybody such that we're able to benefit in a co-creative type of way from the input of all. Because exactly as Becky said, complex problems require very rich input from a diverse group of people in order to resolve them. And we recognize that we can't resolve the world's greatest challenges on our own. We need the help of others. So how did we make this concrete? We developed a vision. Our vision is to open power to help solve some of the world's biggest challenges. Very lofty, very ambitious, but it's actually true. By electrifying communities in Africa, for example, by the way, there are 1.2 billion people in the world without access to electricity, 700 million of them in Africa. Hundreds of millions of people continue to die every year in Africa just from malaria, very simple, malaria. And one of the ingredients for resolving that problem is electrification of communities. We can be part of the solution, not the entire solution, but we can, in fact, deliver this vision. And then we developed a mission. And the mission is a very concrete roadmap for who we want to become, what we will do in the future. Open energy to more people open energy to new technologies, open up new ways of managing energy for people, open up energy to new uses, and open up to more partnerships. And that is a roadmap for our management team, and it is an indicator to our investors, to our customers, to our suppliers, to our employees, as to where we're taking our business and why they need to be part of it. And it is a very helpful decision-making tool for our, uh, for our management team. And this is how we said we were going to bring open power to life. Here are the sustainable development goals that we said we would subscribe to, and as you can see, they're all consistent with our open power vision and mission. And we rolled it out around the world, culminating in uh, ringing the, the opening bell at the New York Stock Exchange once we had rolled out the new brand across the entire uh, 40 countries of the NL Group. Um, we then, of course, need to engage with multiple stakeholder groups in order to tell that story. And all of you are very aware with who the stakeholder groups are that all of us need to be engaging with. Here's some of the press uh, engagement, some of the um, uh, civil society engagement that we have, um, and some of the uh, activations of, of this brand, Formula E. Um, which is the electric car racing series, uh, which we are the official power partner of and the official smart charging partner. So talking about the new technologies that we're bringing to life. We again went back to the New York Stock Exchange to ring the closing bell this time because we delivered the first ever carbon neutral event in the history of motorsport, which was the Formula E race in New York City, where we offset all the carbon emissions from all of the logistics, all of the flights, everything for everybody to get there. And so we had, for the first time in history, um, a carbon neutral event, and the New York Stock Exchange recognized that by letting us come and ring the bell. Uh, we partnered with Motor E, um, so Motor GP, again, electric mobility, very important. Here's some of the recognition that we've had for this sustainability brand that we've built and the engagement that we've had. Um, and again, a little bit more one that we're particularly proud of, Fortune magazine have put us three times in the last four years in their list of 50 companies that can change the world. Um, we were 
Brand Finance recognized us as the strongest brand in the global utility sector. Forbes magazine, 19th best company in the world to work for. I'm not sure where that came from, but anyway. They, uh, Harvard Business School wrote a case study about us. Um, so lots of, lots of fantastic recognition for us. We're going to be talking a little bit about that um, and how to do that in your businesses during my workshop. So thanks very much. Thank you very much to the panelists for their introductions. We're now going to split up into our workshop groups. And broadly, very roughly, we're going to split the room into five the four corners and the middle. So there's four tables in the middle, and I guess you guys should all congregate around the middle there. Um, and Becky, I think you're gonna go into the middle, is that right? I'm gonna take uh, the second table and the third table. Okay, with all your chocolate. Uh, on uh, how to create amazing <laughs> okay. change co-creation. Then we're gonna go into yeah. the four corners, and the rest of us are gonna go into the four corners. So what did we say, Sarah, top left, mm -hmm. Uh, and then Andrew, Andrew, you are there. I'm going to that corner, and Yuka is going to be down here. We're going to be, we're going to go for 40 minutes each, 40-ish minutes, and then we'll come back to wrap it up. So I didn't have any chocolates, but I was delighted with the level of engagement actually that um, my fantastic table uh, showed. So thank you. Um, so just to recap, so we're talking about. Um, engaging um, employees as advocates and all of the associated, uh, let's say, challenges and opportunities that come with that. So um, one of the things that we talked about was the importance, obviously, of engaging leadership at the very beginning of any um, social responsibility program and how you can do that. A um, few things that came through there, some great ideas and suggestions. Um, I think if you are able to demonstrate a connection between um, engaged employees, whether you are using your employees in your volunteering and your social responsibility programs, if somehow you can capture and measure that level of engagement, many of you I'm sure will have employee opinion surveys, um, employee retention, um, uh, fewer sick days, just a, a whole level of sort of happiness and, and, and security in roles, you can often make a direct correlation to customer satisfaction. So if you're using tools like Net Promoter Score, you can often correlate that directly back to the bottom line. And there are several um, McKinsey surveys out there which clearly demonstrate that, um, that there, is, there is very good um, value in engaging um, employees right through um, to driving bottom line, if indeed you are in a commercial world as I am. Um, second thing is um, actually getting and engaging the employees um, directly, and we had a lot of conversation there about it's not just awareness. Uh, we have to make it very clear to the employee how they can get engaged, why they should get engaged. So making that think, feel, and do connection, so not just what do they want to know, but what's the emotional connection that we want to try and create. And once you get a few employees involved in doing some of these really fantastic volunteering opportunities, um, they often really enjoy it, and that can become um, infectious. Um, communication obviously is key to make sure that your employees know what's going on, but don't just wait until annual report time. Don't just do it on a quarterly basis. Make sure that you're talking about your um, programs, your social responsibility initiatives um, at every level, all of the channels, all of the tools, chief exec right down to people on the shop floor need to have a voice and need to be communicating about this so that it's really seen as integrated into your overall brand. Um, and then the other thing we talked about was um, keep it local. So if you do have a corporate social responsibility program, sometimes the word corporate doesn't work with employees. They tend to think it's something over there. It's not for me. Um, so if you are able to uh, come up with a name or, or, or talk about it in language that, that resonates more with your employees and obviously all your stakeholders, that's great. And um, if you can um, sort of automate as much as you can in terms of measurement to free up your own time and on the local um, on the local side, if you do have frameworks that you create centrally, which will save you a lot of time, ethics, codes of conduct, but then empower, whether it's business units or local offices, to work within those frameworks, I think you'll see a lot more engagement if they have some influence on the activity or the programme that they can deliver locally. Yeah, thank you. So, um, 
We had one question about what is actually value creation, and that was a good discussion because it seems to be that it means different things to different companies. Some were talking about financial value creation, some were talking about non-financial value creation, and it also means uh, different things to different uh, stakeholders. Then we moved to this discussion about the stakeholders, and, and it was very clear that actually you need to tailor the messages according to your, your stakeholders, and you have to simplify and you have to know what's actually sort of interesting and important uh, for them. And it's kind of a problem maybe that some of these um, uh, reports that uh, we are all producing, actually as such, they do not uh, have this, this, this element, which led to the conclusion that one should not sort of, if you have a teams who are both in charge of uh, producing these reports and communicating them, so you should not get sort of exhausted when you have done the, the report ready and then it's just somewhere. Uh, but you should also have resources that you have people who are really thinking about, especially communications people who are thinking about how to communicate uh, those, those, uh, those outcomes. So that, that was an important, um, important uh, point. And then there was also some uh, questions about you have to understand these different stakeholders and know how to communicate them. But also, um, if you then organize some events, for example, that they would be in the same room and discuss with each other, then it was mentioned that it's very important that in that kind of um, events that you are extremely uh, transparent so that, that everything that has been said there is, is publicly available. Otherwise, you could get some problems. So these were the, uh, the findings. So we shared um, amongst our group how everyone works currently between investor relations and uh, sustainability. Um, and then there were also a few people who were um, wanting to learn from a, a kind of client advisory perspective as well, um, or actually that were the investors from private organisations. So it was a really interesting mix. Um, we, we identified a number of common themes coming out as everyone explained how it works at the moment for them. So there was um, a lot of sense of transition and things being figured out across many teams, blurred and grayed lines between different departments and, and how it works was um, kind of all quite muddied waters um, and there were quite a few people who were in a, say, like a transitional phase where they were trying to do something different or trying to work something out. Um, so that was really interesting to hear that, and it seemed to be over the sort of last couple of years time frame for, for most people that this was happening. So it was interesting to see that trend. Um, and then also there was a sort of a data um, challenge emerging as well with a few folks. So how, how the timing and, the, and how that data is represented and trying to make that line up in a, a kind of consist, uh, consistent and coherent way uh, that was recognisable perhaps across different organisations or across different industries um, and the, some of the challenges of when things report differently um, and, and how that can then cause issues with working with the IR team. Um, in summary, for the kind of top three tips, I think, that applied um, to most of these common issues, which I sort of could share from recent changes of a similar nature in, in our departments, um, you know, meet often with the IR team and um, share honest feedback. So we've been working on some new things and some new proactive ideas with the investor and analyst audiences, which we need to serve. Um, but we've kind of been doing it in quite a soft way so that the IR team might, you know, go off to a few of their friendly investors that they speak to a lot and, and maybe run some ideas by them if we were going to do something new, um, run some perhaps sort of draft ideas past them bring it back to us, um, I could then kind of inter interface with the sustainability team and see about the long-term sustainability of continuing to do that. Um, so trying to kind of make sure that, but not just the internal parties are working together, but that feedback loop is coming in from, from the external audiences as well. Um, 
Something else that has proved really useful during a, a transitional point where all the lines are quite blurred and the departmental areas are grey is by having a single point of contact. And this might only be a temporary need, uh, but by having one person in the IR team and one person in the sustainability team who can interface with each other um, and go off to the you know, relevant subject matter experts from the sustainability side and translate what that kind of means back into an IR friendly format um, and then in the same note the IR guys being as having a single point of contact to go off to their constituents and bring that view back and then you having the, that sort of single point of contact between the two of you during this phase where it's all a little bit muddy waters has been really really helpful to keep things moving and, and keep things happening. Um, and I think just highlighting the point of being able to translate as well. Um, I think having a sort of, if there is a, a communications person or a corporate affairs person or someone with a similar background who's able to take sometimes really quite complex concepts and make that friendly for, you know, what does an investor want out of this? Why are they asking us this question? Why do they want to know this level of detail about this data? Someone who's able to translate that and also put it into the business context. They want to see how this fits into your business strategy and why you're doing it. Um, and, you know, the, the ROI for any investment and try and loop all that back all the time. So if there's somebody who can help to do that, that also improves that working relationship and makes the IR team's job a lot easier. So that was summary from us. Yeah, sure. So um, we structured our session around three of the golden rules of co-creation. Um, so the first um, is that relationships are the source of Results. So we find that if we want to get to great ideas and great solutions, you need collaboration. And to get to collaboration, you need trust. So we asked um, everyone to break down the barriers between the professional and the personal by sharing some secrets with one another. Um, and it was awkward, but it's a really important part of uh, how you work together um, to get to great ideas and sustainability. Um, so the second golden rule uh, is that the best team is a diverse one. And I'm always amazed at how in frequently uh, sustainability practitioners speak to customers as part of the work that they do. Um, and sometimes they don't even speak to internal departments like marketing uh, or insight. So we talked about the importance of that. And in the absence of having any actual customers in the room, we uh, used a technique called the gossip game, which is a projective technique to put um, yourselves in the shoes of somebody else. Um, and uh, we did that thinking about sort of, we had a good old gossip about sustainability teams, what it's like to work with them when things are brilliant and what it's like when things don't go as well. And then the, the final uh, golden rule is that anyone can be creative, you just need uh, the right tool. So I don't know if Ed's here, but we actually set ourselves the challenge of coming up with some new ideas for this conference um, and how it could work next year. So I just thought if anyone's in charge and listening, I just thought I'd share them. Um, there you go, right. So uh, the first was about structuring the conference around a particular dilemma or case study and have everybody work on uh, that together. Um, the second uh, was around collecting information and sharing it on the footprint of the conference. The uh, third was um, around having a sustainability hackathon where we actually get coders working at the back of the room while the conference is going on and uh, we judge the idea at the end and the top idea gets funded. Um, the next one was um, about uh, running the conference in a place that had natural light, um, but even better, <laughs> in um, a place, in a, a sort of enabling people to get closer to nature, in a retreat um, uh, sort of environment, maybe you have a massage. Um, but, um, but another lovely idea connected to that was that everyone comes with an issue that they're working on that they can put up on big bits of paper around the room and you have a look and you share your experience and your sort of insight into uh, how you uh, deal with that. Um, there was uh, an idea for an ethical Tinder, uh, which is basically a, a conference app. Um, so you could request meetings, you'd have a speed dating station, be able to share quotes and polls sort of really easily with everyone in the room. And then the final one, um, sort of no disrespect to, to us, I think, or any of your other speakers, but um, people want some celebrity CEOs on the panel that they can give a good <laughs> grilling to um, around how seriously they're taking the agenda. So yeah, so thank you.
I'll write them up nicely for you. <laughs> but yeah, no, amazing ideas, and thank you. So well done to the little team. Um, so my workshop, we split into two groups, um, and we studied two companies uh, from people who were actually in those groups. The people, the rest of the people in the groups clearly had very little or even no knowledge of that industry. Um, and the job of the team was to build in 30 minutes, and by the way, this is a process that takes a year. So in 30 minutes, they needed to come up with the starting point for what might a sustainability brand look like for the two companies that were chosen in each group. So I've asked Neil and Catherine to give you 60 seconds of feedback on that. Can you hear me? Yeah, oh, great. Tetra Pak, really interesting. I didn't know that much about Tetra Pak. Um, apparently they uh, produce equipment to process food and make it um, uh, transportable and then produce the packaging solutions that allow that food to be transported. Their, um, their mission is making food safe and available everywhere, which is, which is a great mission. Um, but their big uh, challenge at the moment is, is packaging and how they make that uh, more environmentally friendly um, and, uh, and deal with the issue, the big issue of plastics, which is obviously um, heavy, uh, high in people's consciousness at the moment. So um, we, we established that the, uh, the packaging that they currently use can be recycled, but it can't be used by Tetra Pak again because the fibers aren't long enough when it's been recycled and therefore for various reasons they can't make the same packages twice. But it can be recycled. Um, and uh, that was really interesting. And then we had a, an interesting conversation around, is it, isn't it about the food? Uh, you don't have an issue with the food. Isn't it about the availability of the food and the location of the food? And can we do anything to help, help with that? But um, the challenges we, we came up with, um, it, understanding the customer needs and the market you're operating in and how that's going to develop. Can you get your crystal ball out and understand what the future looks like? You know, you've got lots of different options. Um, understanding the environment you're working in um, and understanding what your stakeholders really care about. Do they, do they really care about the packaging or not? Uh, clearly they do. And, and the point that's been made is, is if you're going to make change, you need that high-end CEO support. So um, we talked about um, what, what could we do to the mission statement, because on its own it doesn't mention packaging. So we could, we could add in sustainably making food and safe available everywhere, <laughs> uh, which, is, which is a bit of a get out. But, um, we, 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 we talked about, it's about the messaging of the how as well. So um, could you add some suffixes within or well, outside the mission statement that talk about by, by minimising the impact that our packaging has on the environment, which would take you down a route of developing solutions around that, or by developing new packaging solutions that would signal the fact that you're aware of the issue and you're going to work with partners to try and understand how you fix that issue. Great. Sorry, can I just also just say, the two people who are speaking and giving the feedback do not come from the company, which is the case study here. Um, the, the person from the company is, is another person within the group. So that just gives you an idea about, I guess, the power of co-creation when you're sitting down together to start studying how to look through the looking glass of the future and discover, you know, and start to put the pieces together of what the brand might look like in the future. Catherine, can you tell us about... Um, the second one. Yes, yeah, so we were looking at um, Arcadis, uh, who are a consultancy company. So um, they work on major construction products, actually uh, projects uh, during the, the, the design phase. Um, actually, getting major uh, infrastructure projects which mitigate against, uh, well, protect against climate change. So climate change is a little bit of an opportunity for them, but also, you know, long term it will kill us all. So, um, <coughs> what they bring to the project at the outset is their expertise and their experience. Um, and one of the main challenges is digitalization. So that expertise and experience can be digitized, and then they don't own it anymore. And then what do they what do they have to offer? Um, so some of the ideas we've come up with are how this, you know, how they can stay in business for the next 20, 30 years and continue to, to create value is to, to own that digitization um, so that they're the ones capturing the experience and, and their expertise, but also every time that they do a project that can feed back into you know, using machine learning or whatever, uh, whatever kind of tools they want to use then. So they have this kind of circular idea of their expertise and, and experience continually developing and growing with every new project that they do. Um, we also looked at, you know, they're, they're involved very much at the outset of a project, but obviously, you know, things are changing. These big capital projects are going to be funded by governments. They're going to be looking for 
more um, sort of sustainable outcomes. And then you're looking towards the end of the project life, perhaps, and using material, designing for deconstruction, so using materials which can be recaptured and reused at the end of the project. So we've got this sort of circular economy principles. And then their assets are their people. Obviously, they're the ones with, uh, with you know, uh, 26,000, was it? It's an enormous number of people. I didn't realize how big they were. Um, and making sure that they're ready to adapt. They're obviously very intelligent people, all these engineers, but continually developing them and, and getting them to learn new things and change as, as that environment in which they work changes to make sure that they remain employed and employable and continue to deliver project uh, value for their, for their clients long term. So um, I don't think we've come up with a complete strategy yet, but we did start playing with this idea of circles. You've got the circular economy, the sort of uh, you know, experience and experience um, and expertise sort of learning from each project and also this continual development of the people. So I think we've probably got a strategy in the making there. So. <laughs> Great. Good. Thank you very much. Well done to both of you. Um, I think the point that I would just like to make from this is the opportunity of building a brand, particularly around sustainability, and if you make it about shareholder value, is for you as a communications professional to really get underneath the skin of the business and, and have a really meaningful impact in driving the business forward alongside the CEO. Um, and it's something which, as communicators, I think in the past, traditionally, we've not had much opportunity to do. So um, I think this is a, it's a really exciting moment uh, for us and, and a great challenge. Anyway, thank you very much to our panelists. Um, thanks very much to all of you for participating in the workshops. And it is coffee break, so time for some more caffeine.